anyways, this week I get to kick off a new series called Mind Wars, and next week the professor, Mr. Stephen Bush, will be leading us. Um, and, and we're very excited about this series because uh, we, we titled it Mind Wars with this idea that we're going to do a little study from Proverbs uh, saying how do we make wise decisions? How do we take the book of Proverbs, which is a book of wisdom, and how do we find a handful of scriptures that will help us behave and live in a way that the world goes, wow, that's great. And we were thinking of mind wars because uh, we, we have to make, the one thing that we have to do every day is make decisions, right? I mean, no matter who you are, you can't get around the fact that you've got to make decisions. And when we think of decisions, uh, you can think of uh, a, a battle going on for your soul and your heart, kind of like two sides playing against each other. And the old Bugs Bunny had like the devil on one side and me on the other, right? Glad that three or four of you caught that one. All right. And so, and then the two kind of personalities are fighting, right? And, and so as we talked about uh, where we're going at the series, we wanted to talk about how, how do we live and behave in such a way that we can increase the odds that God is going to win out on our decisions. What we're really saying is how do we say, when I make decisions, I'm going to make them in a way that gives glory to God. I'm going to make them and think in such a way that God goes, man, I am so happy that you think and go that way. Rather than us living going, boy, I've got a bunch of stories of how I screwed it up, right? I just messed this up and I messed this up. And, and, and again, no matter who we are, no matter what age we are, we have more and more decisions to make. And the older you get, the decisions don't get easier, do they? In fact, they get more and more complicated the older you get. And I know if you're in high school right now, you're going, are you kidding me? There can't be any more complication than this. But trust me, it, gets, it just gets worse making decisions, right? And some of us long to go back to high school and like, like that was the decision we could make in middle school, right? And, and, and here's just what I want you to know. I want you to know this, that, that what we want to do today is we want to help you begin to have a plan or a perspective on making decisions decisions, on making decisions. And, and this is why, and this is why, because <clears throat> it is difficult to make decisions, and we as a church sometimes make it even more difficult when we tell people how we made decisions. And here's what I mean, is that sometimes in a church we tell people how we made the decision, and it gets really goofy. And it hurts our witness, because the mission of the church is to move people closer to Jesus, and core value number one is that we exist because people need Jesus, right? And if we could explain to someone how we make a decision and it brings glory to God, all right, it may have the opportunity to move them closer to Jesus. So what I mean is you're sitting there at lunch and someone's like, hey, what's on your mind? You look like you're really wrestling. You're going, hey, I got this really big decision to make. Now in the back of your head, you're going, hey, my mission as an individual who follows Jesus is to help someone move closer to Jesus. And I could begin talking to them about Jesus, but it's probably not going to go anywhere. But you could begin telling them how you go about making a decision. And you've snuck into their mind through the back door. And suddenly they're going, I don't make decisions like that at all. Wow, that is amazing how you do it. I wonder if I should be making decisions that way. You see, you suddenly... Tear, torn down some walls and move them closer to Jesus by inviting them to understand how you make decisions. Now, with that in mind, what we wanted to do is we wanted to just give you a couple of examples of how Christians explain or how Christians make bad decisions. Okay? And so let me just give you a couple, and, and here's what I think is funny. The minute I, I get into this, I want you to begin to kind of recall stories of how you, you've heard some silly ones, all right? And so we have, first of all, the Bible as the magic eight ball. All right, Jesus, I've got this really big decision to make. Should, should I date him or not? Should I date him or not? Should I date him or not? And you, you just close your eyes and you do the little flip thing and you open it up and it's like, oh, good lamentations. <laughs> this is going to be great, right? And you're reading and you're reading and you're like, oh, wait, that's not what I want. Hold on. Let me shake it up again, right? And then you flip again until you get to a passage that you somehow interpret and go, see, this means that I should do whatever that decision is, right? And, and so here's what I'm saying. If you have a friend who's a skeptic, or you have a friend who's going, 
hey, you love Jesus, how do you make decisions? And you explain to them that you make decisions using the magic eight ball Bible. Have you helped or hurt your witness? You've heard it. Not only that, but quite honestly, the Bible's never meant to be a magic eight ball, is it? Right? I mean, you can't shake it up and go, yes, maybe, no doubt, you're going to hell. Okay? That's not in the Bible at all, right? All right, here's another one. I heard someone explain this to me, and I just stared at him. Okay? They said, yeah, so I had this really big decision to make, and I was praying about it, and I was in my backyard, and then, and then I opened my eyes, and a bird flew by, and I knew what I should do. <laughs> and I said to them, you were in your backyard, and, and really you had a bird fly by. You do know you live in Ohio, and you have a bird feeder out in your backyard. Like, that's not on you. Like, if you said an elephant walked by, then I would consider that maybe to be a sign from God. But the bird really isn't that unusual. I'm not, I mean, it could be a sign from God. I just, I don't think so. And then they started laughing and they said, you know, come to think of it, there were about 10 birds in my yard. And I said, well, see, you should have made 10 decisions that way, right? And again, we just say things and I'm going, I don't think that's how this was meant to work. Let me give you another one. Let me give you another one. Someone said, I was really wrestling with the decisions, and then I heard the thunder, and I knew what I should do. And I said, oh, you heard thunder. Was it like in the middle of a bright sunny day? He said, no, I was getting ready to storm. <laughs> so you heard thunder when it was getting ready to storm, and you knew what you should do. Oh. And I just want to shake some people when they tell me these things. Like, I'm not sure that's God speaking to you. Again, I don't want to tell you it's absolutely not. I'm just saying that that's, that's probably not the best way for us to make decisions and try to interpret that as a voice from God. Okay, so here I understand what the skeptics are saying when they're like, you Christians are crazy. You make decisions and like, you, you, you think that some intervention has happened when ordinary things in life happen. And then we, we say things that, again, could be true. But sometimes we can twist them, and I understand, again, why the skeptic, why someone who, who doesn't believe in Jesus, an atheist, says, hey, I'm not sure I'm buying this. Well, we say things like, and then I heard a voice whisper to my heart. Now, if I don't believe in Jesus, I'm going to say, and did he whisper to your liver and kidney as well? Because I hear a voice speaking to my, my stomach on a regular basis, and it always says the same thing. It always says, pizza pizza, right? And I just want to know, well, and what's your voice sound like? Well, my voice sounds remarkably like me. You mean God sounds like you when he speaks? Yeah, that's how the voice sounds like. Oh, really? Okay. And, and again, I'm not saying God never speaks to your heart. Don't get me wrong. I believe God speaks to your heart. I believe the Holy Spirit is in touch with us and speaks to us. I'm just saying that sometimes, all right, sometimes that's not really how we made the decision, all right? And we had a process that we went through, and then we kind of we, we kind of just listened and we felt like God was affirming the idea we already had. Now, if God has spoken to your heart and that's how you made a decision, all right, d d don't get me wrong, it happens, all right? And sometimes the decision we make when God speaks to us contradicts every logic and reason, right? Look, every time we take up an offering and you give money to the offering plate, to the outside world, that is counter-logical. Okay, it makes no sense. You're giving your hard-earned money away to an organization that doesn't represent, that is teaching you falsehood, right? And you go, no, I think this organization is teaching us truth, and I, I see the difference this organization makes in the culture and society, but to the outside world, they go, it's just crazy for you to make a decision to give 10% of your income away. That's nuts. But every day, every Sunday, you make that decision. So again, we make decisions based on God's leading that sometimes are counterintuitive to the outside culture. Let me give you just a couple more examples of how not to make decisions or ways that I've seen and heard disabused. Because how many of you can make somebody else's phrase say whatever you want it to say? Like, I, I can make my wife tell me no in bed and twist that and make sure it's a pretty much a yes. All right? I'm really good at it. I'm really good at deceiving myself and twisting anything I want. And, and, and I've seen people take the Bible and make it say something that it was never intended to say. And I literally have heard, uh, here, I'll give you two of these real quick. Okay? Let me give you two of them. I was talking to this guy, and he was really struggling with his marriage. And then we, we met again, and he said to me, look, I want you to know we don't need to meet anymore. I went, oh, okay, great. 
you got your act together, your, your relationship with your wife's all good again? He goes, yes. And I went, well, explain to me how you went about that. How did you come to that conclusion? He said, I was praying one night, and I read some scripture, and I knew what to do. And I went, oh, this is going to be great, right? Because the Bible led him to the truth that he's found and the answer to his question. And he said, you see, I found in the Bible that all these guys in the Old Testament had multiple wives. And he goes, so I've concluded that it's okay for me to sleep with my girlfriend and still remain faithful to my wife. (laughs) I didn't know what to say. Like, I just stared at him like, really? That's the jump you made? That's what you got from the Bible? That you could have a relationship with your girlfriend and still be faithful to your wife? And I suggested to him, in rather blunt ways, that that was the improper way to read the Bible and gain insight from Scripture. Of course, do you think he wanted to hear what I had to say? No, he did not want to hear it. Here's another one. Some of you know, if you haven't seen it, by the way, because you helped fund this. We put new carpet in up at the parlor because like it was ripping up and it had become a tripping hazard. And especially in the parlor area, we got a lot of people with wheelchairs and, and walkers that, you know, do the shuffle thing. And, and, and carpet that's ripped up and it's just not safe. And so it not only looked bad, but it wasn't safe. So we put new carpet in. Go up and check it out. You'll see the steps like aren't even done. They were here working late last night and couldn't finish it. But, but I've been at churches literally where there were people who left the church because the carpet that was put in was not blue. Now, I know some of you have been part of church cultures long enough to know that we're really good at making a big deal out of stuff that should never be a big deal, right? Like, oh my gosh, right? And those of, some of you are like, back here, and we we call this like the service for recovering church people, right? Because you've been wounded and hurt, and we've come back, and you're kind of like, hey, I'm trying to figure out if this is a safe place to be, and and here's good news for you. Nobody's complained about the color of the carpet, okay? No one's complained about it, but but their logic from this place that I was at when they complained that blue was the color of carpet it had to be, and therefore they were leaving, was is that they read that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the sky, And the heavens and the sky are blue. And therefore, God only likes blue carpet. And they were leaving the church. I didn't, again, I don't know what to say to that. I'm like, really? That's that's the the logic. That's how you're, that's how you make decisions, right? And so what we wanted to do today was, again, talk about how we make decisions and, 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 and the process that we do. Now, real quick, what I want to do is I want to give you a couple of places where you may have to make a decision. Because there are decisions in life that should be easy, that should be easy and sometimes are not. You ready? Decisions in life uh, that should be easy and sometimes are not. Should I murder my child or not? Should be easy, but sometimes are not, right? I know Stephen and Kelly got a new baby, and I know the Lasers got a new baby, and a handful of you. In fact, we talked that something's in the water around here, which is good. We're just growing the church from the inside out, right? And uh, you, you... you better pick up the slack here. You're slacking, okay? All right. And all I'm saying is this, is that, that uh, sometimes being a good parent, come on parents, means that your child survived you that day. Amen? Right? And if you've ever been up at four in the morning with that screaming, crying baby, and you're just, your prayer isn't God heal the baby. Your prayer is God let the baby survive me. Right? And, and, and we should give out awards. Like on a couple Sundays, you should just walk in and go, I should get the award this week. My child survived me. Amen? And you should get an award that Sunday because you're, you did a good job as a parent. Your kid lived, right? Again, decisions that should be easy but are not. All right, my marriage is difficult. Should I give up? And again, I'd love to tell you, hey, that decision's easy. And it is, but the actual making of the decision and living into it is, is not always easy. I want to buy that. Oh, I saw it on TV. I just want, I want, I want, I want, I want. Oh, but I don't have the money. But I have MasterCard. Dum, 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 dum. We should probably do like the Star Wars, like Vader theme song right there, right? Yeah, there you go. Like, it's all bad right here, right? Evil is entering in. Should I keep my baby or not? Again, the decision should be easy, but it sometimes it's not. Then there are decisions that are just straight difficult. All right? Should I take this job or that job? 
When do I admit that I can no longer care for my spouse or my parents? And maybe I need to put him or her or them into assisted living or a nursing home because of the advanced care they now need. Do I marry him or not? Which college should I go to? Then there are decisions that look like maybe there's no right or wrong answer, but then there's a better and best. Should I eat the Snickers bar or the Reese's? Somebody in the first service said, just eat them both. I said, you know how many laps I got to run to keep this good looking girly figure? Did I hear a moan down there? You're going to hell for that. (laughs) Which day should we get married? Again, probably not a right or wrong, just a better and better. All right? Which investment should we make with our savings or our life savings? Which house should we buy to raise our family in or downsize now that we're retiring? Listen, life is full of decisions, right? In fact, right now, I can promise you this. Right now, my wife is sitting there going, would you please stop talking about it? You're giving me anxiety, all right? Just even talking about making the decisions. You may be one of those persons that's just like, stop, stop, because I'm just starting to roll through all the decisions that I gotta make. Should I continue on with my education? Should I do this, should I do this? And you're like like holding on to the seat in front of you, gripping it with a nail that's gonna cross it, going, I don't wanna hear any more about decisions. Here's what we gotta know. The choices that we make are often significant and have eternal consequences. Here's what I want you to know. I used to work uh, for my father-in-law who helps people getting out of jail, inmates uh, who, who have gotten out of jail get jobs. And I used to work with him. And here would be how the story goes. We would bring our clients in, again, these convicts, and they would be in and they would sit down and they would start uh, filling out job applications. And our job was to say, What's your skill set? How can we place you in one of these companies knowing that here's your background and here's your skill set and are you going to be trustworthy? And again, we had this long process we had to go through. And inevitably, sooner or later, one of them would say, and and is this your job? And I would have to admit that, no, it's just something I was doing on the side and that I'm really a pastor, which somehow led into, now I must confess my life to you, which always drove me nuts because I never want, like I finally started to lie to people and said, no, I'm a painter. And uh, so, so the, the conversation almost always, to a T, went like this. Almost always. You ready? It started out, because here's what I want you to know. Very rarely have I ever met anybody who said, I'm going to make a decision today, and it's going to mess up my life forever. I've never met that person. But I met a lot of people who said, I made a decision, and then another decision, and another decision, and another decision, and suddenly I couldn't get back from where I where I went to. And so this is the way the story went with the convicts. It would be, well, we were... We were hanging out with this group of people. Oh, are these your friends? Well, only some of them. Okay. And then it went, and it was 3 a.m. Now, just pause. Teenagers in the room, teenagers online, listen, 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 listen. If it's somewhere between midnight and 6 a.m., there is nothing you're going to do that's positive. Okay? Unless you have a job that is third shift, there is nothing that happens at those hours that's going to be a good story later. Okay? It just won't be a good story later. Right? And so the story is, I was hanging out with this group of people, and then it was this time of night, and then it, we made this decision, and then this decision. And I always wanted to stop them right there. I never did, but I always wanted to stop them and go, right there. Didn't you have some hints that maybe you were headed down the wrong path? Like, didn't this group, this time, and these two decisions suggest maybe this wasn't going to end well. And then you trail that along until they got this decision, which landed them in jail for X amount of years. Right? Because we know that nobody ever wakes up and goes, I'm going to make a decision today that will screw up my life forever. Most of us wake up and go, what is the best decision I make? And then we go, I don't know how to make this decision. And on a regular basis, the biggest question I get is, how do I make the right decision? All right, so, so here's some scriptures that begin to guide us. You ready? Psalm 25, verse 4 and 5. Make, make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are God of my salvation. For you I wait 
all day. Now, just pause a second. If you were like, oh, I am so excited. He's done this build up, this big intro on how to make decisions, and he's going to give us the way to make the easy and the right decision every time. I'm going to let you down. Instead, it's a process that's very difficult. And what we're going to do is just give you some tools to help you make the right one. You ready? And it says this. The first thing you see in this passage is it says, teach me your paths. Now, God, touch my head and insert everything I need to know into my brain immediately with a touch. Because instead it says this is a learning process. And then it says, lead me in your truth. And what we got to know here is that we're always going to be behind God, trying to watch over his shoulder and go, what's the right decision to make? And at no point in time do we go, I got it, God, I'm going to lead from now on. I've I've come to the supreme knowledge being. I've got it from here on out. And then the last part of this, I just wish we could edit out. Like, I would just love if we could edit the Bible out and take out the parts I don't like, and this is one of them. Because it has that W word that I absolutely cannot stand. And it says, for you I... You don't even want to say it, all right? And some of you don't either because I've been at the red light sitting beside some of you and watched how you behave, all right? But for you, I wait, meaning that, that sometimes the decision we make is to just sit still and do nothing because sometimes godly decisions are crockpot decisions, not microwave decisions. James 1.5, here's another passage. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives to all generously and without reproach and it will be given to you. You see here, I just want you to know that God doesn't have some fountain of knowledge and he's like, oh, I'm never gonna let you have it. In fact, he's saying, hey, come ask me. I will pour out wisdom to you. I long to just give you all kinds of knowledge so that you can make great decisions. Finally, Proverbs 3, five through six. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. And here's just that battle between, again, the war of the mind. I can trust in my ways, but I'm not very smart. And I can try to make the decision just in my own little head, but I know that sometimes my desires and my ability to deceive myself trumps what God wants and what's right. But if I lean on God's understanding, then my paths will become straight. But notice it doesn't say they'll become easy. There. Isn't that clear? Everybody ready? We can go home? It's it's not so clear? All right, so hopefully when you came in, you grabbed a bulletin and a menu and you got one of these dudes. If not, you can grab one on the way out. And here's what I want you to know. Uh, We've given you some help because I said, hey, that's not going to be a good way to end the message. And so we've given you basically uh, nine ways to make a healthy decision. And the reason that it's in a triangle is because I want you to think of how we make decisions as pouring your decision into a filter. And then you can take this, and if you cut it correctly, you can kind of make a filter. Uh, I I don't really recommend it because it's hard to read that way. I recommend just putting it on your fridge or something as it is. But, but here's what we wanted to do. We wanted to have you something that you could take home and go, hey, I've got the nine steps in making godly decisions. And then think of it as a filter that you pour your decision into and it has to go through these different levels. And after it's done through these different levels, that you're probably going to make the best and wisest decision that you can make. And what we know is that Romans 12, 2 says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his pleasing good will, All right? And so what we're doing is we're asking you to pour this through the filter, really have a godly worldview, let it soak through the filter, and a godly decision will drip out at the end. Now, pause, here's just, here's just my, my warning label that you have to put on, like all the prescriptions say that these are the side effects, All right, Here it is. Not every decision that you make that is correct decision will make everybody happy, right? Sometimes the right decision actually makes everybody unhappy. And if you're a people pleaser, all right, I just want you to to just grab onto the reality that you're going to make decisions that will not make everybody happy. And if your goal is to make everybody happy, you will more often than not make the wrong decisions. The other piece that I want you to grab onto and just hold on to as a reality is that not every right decision will turn out correctly because you are not the only factor. 
sometimes there are other pieces out here that you can't control that even though you did the right thing and you made the right decision, all this fell apart. And so while you schemed it, while you planned it, while you organized it correctly, it still fell apart because all these other factors are out here. So if you run it through the filter and you go, oh my gosh, it still turned out incorrectly. I just want you to know that this isn't like a foolproof because sometimes there's other factors. And the filter isn't designed to make everybody happy. It's designed to keep you living with with no regrets and to make God happy. All right, you ready? The first piece of the filter is your past experiences. Again, we say, God, teach me your ways. Okay, how is he going to teach us? Well, one of them is, he says, here's what I've done in the past. If you have trouble going in debt and spending money on things you shouldn't spend money on, your past experience should say to you, I'm not very good with money. And you need to go, hey, if I'm going to make a large purchase decision, I should have someone who's really good with money helping me make that decision. If our Dave Ramsey class, BJ literally has assigned a mentor to some people and told them you're not allowed to spend over $100 unless you talk to so-and-so. Why? Because your past experience says you're no good at this. You ever met someone who's been divorced more than like twice and they're remarried a third time or they're getting ready to marry a third time? I see this a lot with actors. And again, I, what I want to do is I want to walk up to them and just say, hey, there's a common denominator in your three divorces and your three failed marriages. Do you want to know what it is? It's you, right? You're the, I don't know what else is going on, but the common denominator is you. Maybe you've got issues. Maybe you're a terrible chooser. Maybe you're just no good at this. But, but there are things that need fixed in you. You are the common denominator to self-destructing relationships. Your past says you're no good at this. I say this to our high school kids on a regular basis. Like, hey, you're no good at choosing boyfriends. You're no good at choosing girlfriends. Your past experiences suggest that there's something broken inside of you that you're continually attracted to this type of mess. Fix it. Fix it before there are long-term consequences. Right now you just have a broken heart, but there could be bigger consequences later. A positive example is this. When I take my wife out on a date and I run where we should go through my filter, I know this. Right through the first level, I already have the answer. If we end up somewhere that's going to serve her steak, I've done a good job. If we serve her somewhere that's going to bring out soggy fries and a hamburger and a clown serving it, it's going to be a bad night. Okay? But if I can get her steak, and preferably one that actually crawls off her plate, that she has to stab with a fork to keep it on the table, we're going to be good. All right? And I know, hey, my past experience has taught me this is the wise decision I could make here. Number two, biblical lessons. One of the reasons that we, we grab the Romans 12 passage is because, you know, you come to church because it changes your brain. Did you know this? That what gets reminded gets remembered. What gets reminded gets remembered. Did you know that when you read the Bible, it literally, science teaches us, rewires your brain? And so when you read the story of Samson, your brain goes, you know what, my hubris, my arrogance could lead me to an amazing downfall. And I was talking to someone just a couple weeks ago that, that was doing all kinds of big financial stuff in this corporate, and they were saying that my hubris caught me and we had a downfall. And I was talking to someone over here, and they were saying that my hubris caught me and we had a, this huge downfall. I just thought I was like invincible, right? And when I read the story of Moses, what I read is that sometimes God doesn't answer my prayer immediately. Sometimes he makes me wait because if you study the story of Moses, like he wants to rescue the Egypt, uh, Israelites out of Egypt, but then God sends him in the desert for 40 years. And when I read the story of Moses, I think, this is how I pray, by the way, I pray. God, please answer this prayer and don't do it in Moses' time frame. Be, be a little quicker, please, right? Because I, like, just the story of Moses says that sometimes God's going to answer your prayer, just not on your time frame. When I read the story of Esther, I go, God, please pray. Please put me into places where I can have influence. And, and I'm going to realize that sometimes you're doing amazing things in the end, but every day along the path, it's just mundane. Do my job. Do my job so that this moment will happen down here that can lead to greatness. I learned from Jesus himself that, that sometimes following God means we have to do the hard thing. Sometimes it even means we put our life in danger because he's in the garden. He says, not my will, but thine. And so sometimes I have to deny what I want the most because there's a greater 
good. There's a greater good. And so we run all our decisions through a biblical filter. Let me give you an example. Uh, A friend of mine says, hey, I'm looking at taking this job. I say, okay, let's run it through our filter. And this is what he says. He says, "Uh, this job is going to be great. It's going to give me tons of money. I can begin to do this for my family, and we can afford this and afford this and afford this. And I'm like, wow, that's awesome. And and I say, so what's the the drawback? And he says, well, I'm going to be away from my family, working 60 hours a week, on the road at least five days a week. And I said, oh. Well, what's the biblical filter think about that? And he goes, I hate you. Welcome to the club. And he goes, you see, I'm at church, and you keep talking about how the Bible instructs us to put our family first and how it instructs me to put my wife first and how money isn't everything. And I said, so is your decision made? He goes, yes, and I still hate you. I said, I know, but your wife's going to love you more. And the biblical filter helped him immediately make that decision. Again, should I purchase the car? I don't know. Is it going to tie you up in debt? Because the Bible speaks over and over again about the dangers of debt. Is there a different vehicle you should purchase? God's not against us having nice things. He's just against us having no freedom to give and help people out when we should. Next one, your future hopes and dreams. Again, you're just walking down your filter and you're going, you can cut it up and make it look really nice, by the way. Uh, you can walk down your filter and you're going, hey, and my future hopes and dreams, what do I want to do when I get older? My grandma was like 900 before she died. And her last year of life, she still said this to me. I just don't know what God wants me to do when I grow up. And I said to her, well, you better figure it out soon because you ain't got much time left. But the reality of it is every stage of life brings us to a new place where we have to go, God, what do you want me to do now, right? And then we start planning out our future. And if your future is, hey, I want to live in my home forever, and this is where I want to retire, and this is where I want to die, well, then you've got to make these decisions. And maybe the house with 16 flights of stairs is not where you should be living. And if you were like my wife and I, about 15 years ago, we said, hey, it would be really great to live on a farm. That meant we had to change how we did some of our savings and spending. And if you say, hey, I want to go to this type of college, well, you better look and go, hey, therefore, these are the types of grades you get. And I want to have this type of marriage. Well, then don't date this type of person. Because this type of person is not going to have the same values and ideas that you have in marriage. Hey, we're thinking about this. Well, what is that your future hopes and dreams? What is it you got to do now? John Maxwell says we can play now and pay later. Or we can pay now. And play later. Our current circumstances. What are you going through right now? Again, I'm pouring it into my filter. We've gone through all these things. We've gone through uh, past experiences, biblical lessons, future hopes and dreams. And by the way, these aren't in any particular order. You can flip the order all you want. What are my current circumstances? I was talking to a couple, uh, a couple weeks ago, and they were saying, we're thinking about having a baby. And I went, well, great. I think everybody should have babies. That's a wonderful thing once you're married. Once you're married. All right. And, and they were talking to me about it. And then, and then I, I was like, so what's going on? Because I could tell, like, they wanted to say more. And I said, but our marriage is really struggling. And then I said, then don't have a baby. They said, what do you mean? I said, because a baby won't make it easier. Amen? I said, it's going to make it harder. You need to get this figured out before you had another one. Because the other one, listen, listen, doesn't fix it, right? Adding one more doesn't fix one plus one. It makes three, and it makes it confusing. And it makes us tired, right? And I said, why don't you work on your marriage first and take another year or so to just fix that? What are your current circumstances? What are your current circumstances? I tell people all the time, they come to me and say, hey, I just broke up with this relationship. And I'm always amazed I get this co- question. They say, hey, I just had this terrible breakup, or I just went through this divorce. And I, I feel sorry for them, and we kind of talk a little bit. And then, and then they go, but I'm starting to like this guy or this gal. And I go, okay, how long have you been, like, separated? How long have you been divorced? How long was it that this girl in junior high broke up your heart? Oh, about a week. Oh, well, uh, man, I have a thought for you. All right, what if you took six months to a year and fixed you so that when you meet Mr. or Mrs. Wright, you're not offering them a broken you, but you're offering them a healthy you. 
Because there's a danger. Your current circumstances say that you'll look at them and go, please fix me. I want your love to fix my brokenness rather than the love of God. Oh, man. What a burden you place upon someone. And then I get, well, what if they're not still around? And I go, well, if they're supposed to be the one you're with, they will be. Because, after all, didn't mama say you can't hurry love? You just have to. I don't say that W word. I don't know why you wanted to say it, right? Two points for you if you knew the song. Number, number, the next one, uh, prayer. And again, I tell you, these are, these are in any order. I always say if you're going to make a decision, you should have been praying for it long before you got there. Here's what I love about prayer. Prayer, when I get to my filter, I always want to say, God, this is what I want you to do. Here's the decision. Change the world. But when I pray, more often than not, when I run it through my filter, God goes, I'm going to change you. No, that's not what I said. So I'm having trouble with my marriage, and I run that through my filter, and I'm going, God, just change my wife. Make her more this way. And God says, if we're going to pray about it, because prayer is an invitation for God to change me, right? He's going to say, why don't you be filled with more grace, less judgmental, and self-righteousness? And why don't you move this direction? I didn't want that, God. I wanted her to behave this way. No, if you're going to pray about it, and we're going to run it through the filter, I want to change you first. I want to change you first. And again, prayer is inviting God to speak to us. And again, here, maybe God does speak to our heart. But it is a part of the process. It's not the only thing. We don't go, oh, there was a magic bird that flew by. Therefore, I know what I should do. It is, hey, in the process. And I invited God, please, just show me the way. And sometimes God's, God's words are that wait word. The next one is reason. Again, this is amazing because a lot of people look at the Christian faith and go, everything is just, you made it up. There's no reason. But that's absolutely incorrect. We have a faith that is absolutely reasonable. And we should use reason on a regular basis. And that is understanding all that we've talked about, but also some of you use a, a pros and cons list, right? And some of you have other forms that you go, this is how I make decisions. And, and you ask questions like, do we have enough money? That sounds reasonable. Do we have enough time? Well, that sounds reasonable. Do we have enough desire? Is it a want or a need? Is it close enough? When I have kids come and say, hey, I'm looking at going to college, one of the first things that I say to them, it's a question that kind of knocks them back. But I say, how much do you like your family? And they look at me kind of crazy. Like, I, no, I want to know where I should go to college. I, go, I know, how much do you like your family? What? I like my family. I know, but how much? Like, do you want to be with them every weekend for a while? Or do you just want to see them three times a year? Because if you want to be with them every weekend, don't go to college in California. Okay? It won't happen. But if, if you're like, yeah, I could care less. I love my family, but, but man, I, I could see them maybe three to four times a year. Then go anywhere you want. And people don't understand how much that decision plays into what you're going to do. Again, another example is, I want to buy a house. We want to move. All right, here's your job, but you've also got this area that you could be a half hour from. How far away do you want to be from your parents? Oh, my goodness. I saw your mom smack you, too. All right. Yeah, how far do you want to be away from your parents? Like Some of us would be like, look, I can live next door to my parents. And some of you are going, yeah, to my parents, but not my in-laws, right? right? I, I want to be like six hours away. Like I want them to visit on a special day and they have to call ahead because they're going to have to prepare the house, right? right? Again, just how do we make that decision? Well, there's lots of reasoning that goes into that. Wisdom of godly elders. I get to teach uh, our freshmen every week uh, with their freshman focus class. And one of the things that I love is uh, when I talk about making decisions, and I go, I go find someone to talk to to make decisions with. And they all turn to their neighbor, and I go, but not the person sitting next to you. Because they're freshmen just like you. They're not any smarter than you are. Go find someone who knows what they're doing in this area, and then ask them. Find someone who's, who's got years and success. Find someone who specializes in this. And I say, see, like this. Nobody ever comes and asks me how to fix their car. They don't do it because I don't know anything about cars. In fact, there are vehicles I couldn't change the oil because I can't find the dipstick. And when they ask me, where's the dipstick? I go, right here, right? I don't know where it's at, all right? Nobody ever asked me how to fix your car. Nobody ever asked me how to hit a golf ball. I'm no good at it. 
Right? Nobody asked me any engineering questions, and nobody ever asked me, hey, would you come and look at our financial report? We think we got some numbers out of place. And I would go, I have no idea what I'm looking at. But I do have people come and ask me how to make decisions. I do have people come and ask me what the Bible says. I do have people come and ask me relationship questions because those are areas that I'm good at. And when people come, I go, oh, good, you're asking a smart person in this area. But when suddenly you ask me something about a car, I don't know. Go find someone who specializes in that that's older than you are and that has success in that area. Finally, excuse me, we've got two more. A guidance of the Holy Spirit. Here's where I think we get this wrong. The Holy Spirit is not Jiminy Cricket. He's not a voice that whispers in your ear that you can ignore and smack out of the window seal. The Holy Spirit is God, ultimately powerful, able to change everything, able to move mountains. And sometimes we throw the Holy Spirit out of the equation. But the reality of it is we say, God, would you please make evident the path that you're already making? The psalm says, make straight the path. Would you please make evident the path that you're already clearing for me? And then finally, the last piece of our filter that we're talking about is our church and small group experience and grace. You know, why do we go to church? Because it changes our thinking. We're here because when we gather, our brain gets rewired and we go, hey, these values are important, but this is not. It keeps me focused on God and what I'm trying to do. The entertainment world says your marriage isn't important. The minute it gets tough, give up on it. The commercials say if you don't have this product, you're not good enough. You're not pretty enough. There are other places in the world that say, hey, it's always somebody else's responsibility. It's not your fault. And yet scripture keeps saying every decision you make, and I don't like this, is my fault. It's my decision. I must take responsibility for my decision. Again, Proverbs goes back. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. And it says this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make straight your paths. So we're done. I know. We've ended the sermon. There's no altar call I didn't expect anybody to go, I'm giving my life to Jesus today. Here's my hope. You've got your little filter paper, all right, with a triangle on it that looks like this. I know that this week you're going to make decisions. I know. I'm like, genius. You're going to have decisions this week. You're going, how did he know I had a decision to make this week? I just, I'm really smart, all right? And, And here's what I want you to do. I want you to take this paper, and I want you to go home and have some discussion about it. I want you to say, did I run my decision through the filter? Did I, did I pour it in and let it soak through all these levels so that I have a godly worldview decision that comes out on the other side? Should I go to grad school? I don't know. Did you run it through the filter? There may not be a good or, or a bad answer. Maybe just a better or a best answer. Should I date this person? I don't know. Run it through the filter. Should we do this? I don't know. Run it through the filter. Again, the process is to help you live without regret. The process is to say, this is the way to make the most godly and wise decision you can. And it would make my day, it would make my day if you said when you leave today, you know what, that really helped, and now I have a process that I can work through. So here's what we want. We want you to send us some tweets. We want you to send us some emails on how this changed the decisions you're going to make or influenced or totally transform the decisions that you're making right now. We want you to take this and think through your decisions and say, I ran it through this filter, and this is the decision I made. And give us those stories so that we can share those with everybody else. Got it? All right, I want to pray for us, and we're going to invite the band to come up. We're going to do an offering. But what I want you to do right now is I'm just going to invite you to, as we pray, I just want to pray for those who who really would say to me, I have a big decision coming up this month. Maybe it's this week, maybe it's today, it's this month. And I, wanna, I want you to raise your hand, and we're going to pray specifically for you if you've got a big decision coming up this month. And we, again, we just want to pray specifically for you, but also for everybody. So if you've got a big decision this month, go ahead and just throw your hand up, and we're going to pray for you. Ready? God, we have several hands up, and we just want to uh, invite you to be present in this process. And God, help us build a funnel that we can pour our decisions through that they will honor you and bring you glory. And Lord Jesus, touch those right now who have their hands up.
be with them and guide them in their decision making. That they may, that they may surrender to you and not rush what you're doing. In Jesus' name we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, may you go forth ready to make decisions, better equipped to make decisions from a godly worldview. I pray for you this week. May you honor God with all your decisions as people who are beautiful and sacred and live in the grace of God even when we mess up. In Jesus' name, you're blessed.